everybody. Welcome back to F330, Folklore and the Environment, YouTube session number nine for week 13. We're back in session. Well, got a little bit of old business to uh, catch up on. I want to refer back to thought piece number 10. They were generally good, and I've gotten back to you with my comments and uh, responses. Um, but I thought something that almost everybody missed, um, or if you um, if you noticed it, you didn't uh, mention it in your thought piece, and that is the role that Mark Peddlety plays as a musician, songwriter, and creator of media products, uh, which he brings out in that article, in that chapter from the Dirt Book, when he talks about uh, his work uh, with um, the song Loud, right, which is, um, you know, a song that he and some uh, uh, fellow musicians created uh, to uh, deal with the noise pollution issues uh, there uh, out on the waters uh, west of uh, Washington State out there in that Bay Area. And um, uh, they did the song, and then they also did a... Uh, a video, a music video uh, rendition of the song, uh, which um, you could find in that resources page, and uh, I thought it might be worth um, sharing that with you, just a little bit of it, because it's kind of cool. So let's see if we can get this uh, to play for us here. I'll come a little closer. music video is they've got a number of uh, singers who are kind of well known in the area to uh, perform in this meshed uh, version of it. But notice some textural features that are interesting there. One, starting with uh, the kind of whale song, imitating the whale song. Uh, so, you know, obviously very tied to the uh, thematic here of, um, you know, the disturbing noises in the area. And then, um, uh, you know, other textural features, including the um, the indigenous drum there, the sort of uh, light uh, scraping of the drum, that's a native uh, people uh, drum from the area. And so anyway, um, I encourage you to dip into these resources and actually uh, uh, pay a little bit of attention to them. They're pretty interesting. And Mark Peddlety, in addition to being an ethnomusicologist of some repute, is also uh, uh, a, a fairly significant player as a creator of media. And that's where the singing, dancing fish come in. If you go to Ecosong, one of their products there, uh, one of their other media uh, products, uh, actually features, I'm not making this up, some singing, dancing fish. It's worth a look. Next, the vote is in on the professor's choice of YouTube videos, and 
A runaway winner is the Dancing Yaks. The Dancing Yaks, so congratulations, Molly, even though Molly voted for the Carvers. But um, that was the uh, favorite uh, in this sample that I have. And uh, uh, next up were the Carvers, the uh, uh, Inupiaq uh, Carver, which is, you know, quite an interesting um, um, presentation in its own right. And then uh, tied for third place are the Kazakh women, those really remarkable sort of remakings of the look of the, the Kazakh woman over the decades. And also tied was the uh, Lakota piece about uh, this land is stolen, that is the kind of um, evocation of the young people's approach to uh, um, uh, some of those issues. Okay, uh, well, uh, thought piece number 11 will be coming your way, so uh, be on the lookout for that. It's uh, coming along fairly soon, within a day or two, I think. And uh, naturally, I should uh, remind you once again, uh, most significant due dates that are on the horizon, uh, the presentation, either in um, the form of a uh, uh, recorded delivery of your five-minute presentation, or in the form of a um, PowerPoint uh, presentation, due on Friday, May 1, Friday, May 1, coming up, and then the final paper due uh, as of Wednesday, May 6. So those are uh, now very much uh, coming into sight for us. Well, that's kind of old business or wrapping up some things. Let's turn to the new business, the work of the day. So we're in a um, topic called uh, um, Sibindoy Eco-Sovereignty. And uh, we looked uh, earlier in the week at uh, the piece I did on animal agency. We talked about that a little bit in the previous YouTube session. And now uh, we're uh, referencing the piece on uh, Carlos Tomabioy. Well, in reference to that piece, let me just say a few things that I would like uh, to highlight. Um, I talk about this as an example of strategic use of traditional resources. The strategic use of traditional resources. And uh, you can see how um, uh, the um, younger people in the community have uh, dipped into uh, a treasure house of uh, oral tradition uh, to pull forward uh, some elements that are, um, you know, advantageous uh, to empowering the community in this particular moment. And that's something, you know, as folklorists, we're always uh, appreciating uh, tradition, the, the positive work that tradition can do for communities. Uh, and con uh, in contrast to uh, some people who argue that tradition holds people back. And of course, I mean, everything is possible, but uh, for sure we should take into account the ways that tradition can empower communities, and I think we see that uh, with the case of Carlos Tomabioy. The second point I would make is we see here what I call the apotheosis of Carlos Tomabioy. Apotheosis is the process by which a... Um, must be uh, on the hour. That's our clock. Um, but anyway, so uh, apotheosis is a process by where a, a mortal becomes immortal, right? So the, you know, becoming a deity and so forth. Uh, transformation from the human condition to a godlike condition. So the, apotheos the, the apotheosis of Carlos de Mabioy, we, we, we see this historical figure and um, in the article, in the chapter, uh, in this piece that I'm working on, um, I'm able to bring out uh, what we do know about Carlos de Mabioy, who was a cacique, a native and indigenous leader, uh, back in the time of the Spanish colony. And sometime around the period of, uh, around the year 1700 or so, um, he created this last will and testament, which has become a very significant uh, uh, document for the indigenous communities of the Sibundoy Valley. They base their claim to the land and their um, claim to this ancestral connection uh, to the land on this uh, 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 the Last Will and Testament of Carlos de Mabioy. But in the uh, piece that you read, I'm able to go into some of the um, mythic narratives, you know, for example, the, um, the the story that tells how he really is, you know, sort of connected to the thunder deity, his, this extraordinary um, uh, birth that he has. Um, the other one where he's kind of like a solar deity, he is born in the morning, he accomplishes his work in the daytime, and then he uh, dies at the end of the day. He's kind of likened to the trajectory of the sun 
uh, across the sky and just in the space of the day. Uh, so we have this mythical kind of rendering, but we also have the rendering of Carlos de Mabue in legendary form where he's really treated as a historical figure, uh, but, but nonetheless processed into the sort of the way, the, let's say the mentality of the uh, indigenous people. And then we have some of the stories like Taita Bautista's uh, story, and he has that great moment where he says, "A Spanish missionary, a, a missionary father, said to me, uh, 'What if, what if we had chased all the whites out?' You know, it's a very interesting moment in that uh, conversation that uh, that we had. So uh, that's the second kind of thing I would point to: this apotheosis of Carlos de Mabioy, who I heard so much about him when I was there over those decades, but I never really anticipated that they would formulate this idea of the territorio ancestral." Carlos de Mabioy, and this is really an eco-sovereignty claim that they're making. Uh, they're basically um, arguing that as uh, people connected to the land over uh, many generations, um, they feel like they have a kind of a, a, a capacity, an ability to curate the land, to be custodians of the land, um, and they're really staking a claim of eco-sovereignty. Um, so uh, these are some of the things that I, I bring out in the piece for this week. And really, I didn't get a I didn't get a chance to include it in the uh, um, in the uh, papers that I sent you, the pages that I sent you. But uh, they've come up with this really interesting map. It won't show up too well. This is kind of low tech, high tech, isn't it? It's kind of a, quite an unusual format that uh, Pat and I are using here today. But um, you can't see it too well. I might have shown this clip to you. I might have shown this image to you in class one day. But essentially, um, the the uh, young activists there have uh, placed their territorial claim, their ancestral territorial claim, uh, on the map, and they've begun to ag agitate or um, argue for this. Um, in some of the local uh, legal um, processes there. Uh, but anyway, so uh, this is where the, uh, the claim to eco-sovereignty uh, becomes more than just a, uh, let's say, uh, a point of, uh, uh, let's say, rhetoric or something, but they've, they've actually developed a map and, and they have a, uh, a sort of practical plan in a way uh, how to realize this uh, sovereignty that they want to exercise as custodians, as caretakers uh, of the land that uh, their ancestors uh, have, uh, have bequeathed to them. Well, those are some of the themes that come up there. Um, I think that uh, I would close with a couple of points to make here. One is that what we're seeing here in the Sibindoy Valley is just an instance of a kind of a global phenomenon. And I think I talked about this a little bit, you know, back when we were actually having fun together um, on campus. But um, uh, this is something that uh, there's so many instances of this all across the Americas and I'm sure in other parts of the world as well where local and indigenous and tribal people uh, are staking this kind of claim based on uh, what they can provide evidence of um, a long-term capacity to, uh, to, to, to deal uh, effectively and sustainably uh, with, 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 with their land. So uh, we can take this case study as a case in point. Uh, and one that uh, uh, really uh, directs us to a phenomenon that's very important today. It's global in its spread. It's very timely in terms of uh, how it's, uh, you know, um, uh, addressing some of the ecological concerns that uh, people uh, all across the world have today. And it's a potentially transformative process. That is, it has the possibility to really uh, transform the way uh, we think about uh, our connection to uh, nature. You know, just a final thought, I mentioned briefly Astrid Ulloa's book, uh, The Ecological Native, and in that she makes an, an interesting case that um, for better or worse, or I, I guess I should say for better and worse, a lot of Native peoples have been um, sort of assigned to this niche of being the ecological uh, Native. It's a cons She argues in her book, uh, published in 2005, she argues that um, this is a constricting uh, stereotype in some ways. It, it sort of doesn't um, open up uh, avenues to mo modernization, access to uh, modernity for uh, Native peoples. But on the other hand, it does open up a channel whereby uh, they can press claims for uh, conservation of their language, conservation of their traditional way of life, uh, conservation of their claim to the land. Uh, you know, uh, really working on this uh, thesis of the ecological native and presenting themselves 
uh, in that uh, framework. So um, it's a very interesting thing. You, you all might want to think about this. Uh, you know, what are the pros and cons of, um, you know, inhabiting a niche like that, uh, which is limiting in some ways, but, but also opens up uh, certain opportunities. Okay, well, uh, folks, that's kind of what I wanted to get at today. Um, I'll be uh, sending you a couple things. Uh, another thought piece is coming your way. Also, a resource sheet is uh, in preparation. That'll be coming your way. And, um, yeah, then we'll, uh, we'll reconvene, as it were, uh, next Monday for the final week of our, um, hmm, our remote uh, time together. Okay, everybody, nice being with you briefly, and so long.